right. Hi there. My name is Jessica Crow. I am the founder of Apogee, which is a change management training, coaching, and consulting firm. I'm also the host of Apogee's Change Leader Insights podcast. And today here with me, I have Robert Snyder. Hello. Thank you for being here. Great to be here, Jess. So Robert is the founder and president of Innovation Elegance, and he's also the author of a book that's going to come out before the end of the year. We're in 2023, in case you watch this next year. Um, it's called Innovation Elegance, Transcending Agile with Ruthlessness and Grace. And I was lucky enough to preview this book before it's come out because Robert was kind enough to share it with me and I loved it. So if you are just now watching this, go out and read this book, buy it from Robert. Um, it's a great book. And it's all about this methodology that he created based on his background, experience, insights, and wisdom. And we're going to talk a little bit about it today as much as he's willing to share. Um, but first, Robert, why don't you share with Apogee, the Change Leader Insights community, a little bit about yourself, your background, and what led you to write a book about this uh, to begin with? Cool. Well, thanks again for having me, Jess. This is this is fun. So my career, about 30 years, I would uh, encapsulate it as a, at least at the start, a very generic IT consulting career. So served as a developer, database analyst, project manager, test manager, business analyst, risk manager, went for my MBA, came back, slowly pivoting toward more business-facing roles, sales enablement, sales innovation, and I'll call it business PMO instead of mm -hmm. tech PMO. Mm -hmm. Over the last decade, with my colleagues, I found myself writing and talking more about what does good look like for mm -hmm. what I'll call innovation literacy, innovation hygiene. And then what tipped me into pursuing a book was a, a webinar in 2018. It was a Northwestern University alumni webinar where two young women had just finished their first book. Okay. And the the title of this webinar was Do You Have a Book in You? <laughs> subtitled subtitled You Can't Take It With You. Uh -huh. So like typically that. we might, you know, on your deathbed, you, you you know, you can't take your money with you, of course. Right. But in this case, these two new authors were challenging their audience to say, you know, whatever wisdom you know, you've gathered over X number of years and decades of your career, the future generations need it. So yeah, get writing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. I like that a lot. So from all of that, you had this moment where you thought, I can't take it with me. So I'm going to put it out there. And then out came the elegance methodology. So tell us a little bit about what that is. And I have, I mean, I, you know, I know because I previewed the book <laughs> and what's really cool about this too, for um, those of you that are listening, one thing that he didn't mention was his background in the performing arts, which heavily influenced the book in the way that you've sort of explained how to think about um, your recommendations as it relates to the five verbs in a context of the performing arts, which I thought was so creative and really helped um, me personally to understand how to think about this in a different way, which resonated with me because I, I just, you know, the examples were really, really great. So explain the elegance methodology um, at a high level or as much detail mm. as you're willing to share. Mm. Okay. I think it's worth explaining where my mind was in 2019. <laughs> okay. When I, when I first there. put pen to paper, the ambition of the book was pretty modest. All I was trying to do was to paint a picture of what documentation is worthwhile mm -hmm. that other books like the PMBOK or other bodies of knowledge weren't yet talking about. Mm -hmm. So so that was the left brain, the serious, and I'll for those of us of a certain age, I'll call it the Dr. Spock side of the, the equation. Mm -hmm. But as you said, I, I have... You know, I've been in choirs since I was a kid. I've I teach beginner Latin dance. I've been in a couple dozen beginner improv classes, and I've read the book Yes And, so I know enough about the improv world to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a couple dozen musicals, and I felt that there's so there is so much value, collaboration, culture traits that the business world might make a casual reference to, mm -hmm. but. You know, you give me an inch and this book and the methodology takes a mile. Mm -hmm. So the, the original ambition of the book was simply left brain, serious, discipline. Here's what you need to write down. And the right brain, here's how the performing arts matter um, to culture, collaboration, 
audience centricity, the economics of it. And I didn't really, the, the first draft of the book didn't touch culture because that was too big of a topic. Yeah. Um, and it did not confront the existing methodologies, waterfall, agile, hybrid. It didn't mm -hmm. confront those software centric methodologies as much as the book does now. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, and it does, you know, kind of right out the gate. As soon as you start, as, as soon as I started reading it, you do that very, <laughs> very directly. You're like, here's <laughs> how to think about this. And here's what's sort of missing from these methodologies. And here's why. And, you know, part of it is you, you emphasize this idea of being people centric, and that requires both discipline and empathy, the combination of two. So that left brain, right brain that you just talked about. Um, and I, and I really appreciated that because there are a lot of things that are sort of missing and why we get into so much trouble with software development or any sort of methodology that's helping us move and advance change and innovation projects through an organization. Um, but I really appreciated that emphasis on, on, on people and how to, how to bring in discipline and empathy to create something that a team can sustain because it has both pieces versus being too heavily oriented in sort of either direction. So that was really helpful. Um, what about, so, you know, kind of leaning into this idea of the performing arts influencing the methodology, you, um, you know, you talk about in the book, uh, rehearsals detecting underperformance. And I really liked that idea of how, you know, you also included a quote about the magic to a great meeting is that all the work is done beforehand. And that really speaks to some of the methodology that you explain up front, like doing some of the heavy lifting to make sure the rest of the process goes smoothly. Um, and I, and I really like that kind of what was the motivation or I guess what's your experience with, um, or, you know, why does innovation, uh, innovation in organizations change and innovation fall, fall flat so often? Um, so my mind goes in three different directions here. So, so first of all, <laughs> that's a big in, question, a lot the, of little things in it. <laughs> in the, um, so the quote that you mentioned, I think it's worth noting that that quote is from the famous Bill Russell, the American uh -huh. basketball player. Um, you wouldn't expect that sort of comment about meetings to come from a man who's like seven foot tall with 11 yeah. NBA championship rings. So um, I think that's another really fun example of cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. um, and you, so you mentioned rehearsal. If I th close my eyes and think of the, you know, the, the instrumental ensembles I've been a member of or the vocal ensembles I've been a member of, everyone has their part. They, they have a literal sheet of music in front of them they're playing clarinet saxophone drums whatever and so it's it's hard to be a freeloader when the director is going to notice i don't hear the the drum mm -hmm. i don't hear the i don't hear the trumpet so it is a great metaphor to detect underperformance yeah um yeah. and then so now i'm blanking on the third part of what you were asking I was sort of, I know I threw a lot into it because there are so many things I liked that I wrote down. I was sort of picking them up. Um, it really comes down to, you know, when you're thinking about change and innovation and why it struggles in organizations, it may sometimes be due to the methodology like agile or waterfall, mm -hmm. but it can often be really because of the individuals that the change and innovation must be executed through. And so the idea of having this methodology that supports it, but also having, you know, uh, making sure that you're prepared with whether the discipline piece, whether it's the upfront meetings, the documentation, you know, the rehearsals mm -hmm. that can contributes to why I think in my mind, we struggle with projects and change and organizations, but I was curious, you know, kind yeah. of into the root cause, having you explain it in your words, where, so, uh, where that failure point is. So my, one of my stances that's perhaps a little controversial is that I believe all teamwork is worth memorializing, putting on paper in a structured way because your future team thanks you. Mm -hmm. And at some point, code, data structures, they're pretty structured. They're very unforgiving. Mm -hmm. So. Every team has to decide at what point upstream from the code are you also going to start being very unforgiving 
-hmm. about the database model, the GUI design, your process flow. Um, so, so this structure, you, you know, I, I like to use the analogy. There's a, there's a phrase, you can ignore the laws of gravity, but the laws of gravity don't ignore you. Right. <laughs> you, you can ignore the laws of teamwork, but the laws of teamwork don't avoid you. You can right. ignore the laws of code automation, but those laws don't ignore you. So if you're right. like, for lack of a better word, if you're fluffy upstream, nailing jello to a wall and and hyper forgiving just you know waffling in the breeze um that's not helpful that that's i'll call it low expectation setting yeah then why are we why are we a team why are we on unless we have direction and focus and discipline um so i i think you know structure documentation putting this stuff on paper helps to raise, it gives us license to raise yeah. our expectations of ourselves, of our teams, of our customers, et cetera. Um, so the, as you were talking, just the, the paradigm comes to mind of, I'm worried that too many organizations, too many projects, as their, their North Star, they talk, they're meeting right. factories and documentation is secondary. It's an afterthought. We even use the word artifact, mm -hmm. paper trail, audit trail. Mm -hmm. So it's talk, 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 maybe at the mercy of the strongest personality in the room, mm -hmm. the, monop the monopolizing opinions. And hey, Johnny, go take notes, mm -hmm. take meeting minutes. You know, and what, what this methodology aims to do is invert that to assert to every team, what you are collaborating on is worth documenting. And it's, that's the, so the, the, the framework that I learned early in my career, it's called earn versus burn. Yeah. And so what earn is, is every agreement that a team collaborates on and you knows divergent thinking, convergent thinking mm -hmm. lands on the agreement, whatever title it has roadmap, project charter, process flow, et cetera. But, but that is the, that is the umbrella. And we're just here to chat meet email as much as we need in mm -hmm. order to align have you know and, and form this alignment factory this agreement factory so i'm i'm trying to invert the paradigm instead of talking being the master mm -hmm. and and a library of meeting minutes being the the output I'm trying to invert it to say yeah. every everything you do is worth the five verbs. Yeah. Or or if not, then do it at the pub because evidently none of it's worth documenting. Right. Right. Well, let's talk about the five verbs really quickly because we haven't. Are we? Is it okay if we go through them, or of do you want to save those for the book? Okay. Because this was this was this is good. So the five verbs are draft, review, revise, approve, and distribute, which I really I love those. And there was some intention behind why you chose verbs and why you chose those words. Um, tell us about kind of the, 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 your thought process specifically about those verbs and how they help do what you're describing. So number one, minimal ambiguity. Mm -hmm. It's really diff difficult to twist or spin draft. Yeah. <laughs> Approve. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the other concern that I have is that too many, um, too many teams use adjectives. I can't put that stuff in a project plan. Right. <laughs> like they they use words that are fair, directionally accurate and great. Let's be efficient. I can't put efficient in a project plan. Right. Right. So so in a project plan, if I'm if and yes, if someone has got to formally plan, create a formal plan for stuff, again, to set expectations with a certain amount of visibility, certain amount of transparency, a certain amount of pacing, um, I think that the five verbs are a wonderfully unambiguous way mm -hmm. to minimize reinventing the wheel and to clarify and, and have the team take, take a stance and take accountability. What do you do that's worth putting on paper mm -hmm. and everything else? Own it, but own that it's just a chat. Right, right. So there, there, there is, can I tell the origin story of the, yes, please. So, 
So about, this is almost approaching 10 years now, former employer, we had purchased uh, a software package that was a bolt-on to our CRM. Mm -hmm. And that ecosystem is huge, right? This, that I'll leave it at that. And the consulting firm's project manager presented to me what he called their default project plan. And I looked at this project plan. It had about 150 rows, piece of cake. It had 40 distinct verbs. I'm looking at this project plan and I see verbs like initiate, develop, distinguish, consult, choose, determine, and my favorite, socialize. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what of this stuff is worth putting on paper? Yeah. What of this stuff is is a conversation of two people, 10 people, these words really ambiguous? And and what is just like a switch in your tool? Yeah. But I couldn't tell where the complexity, some of these lines on his project plan had like 20 subtasks that they were, they were just hiding from us. Right. And so so the project did not go well. That project plan ballooned into, I don't know, I don't know if it was a thousand lines, but it was not the 150 rows. Right. Right. The, it was very, it was very painful. And so it, it reminds me of the reason why I'm so obsessed about methodology is that I believe, you know, a poor methodology ruins projects. It mm -hmm. ruins jobs and it ruins relationships. Mm -hmm. So many otherwise great colleagues, coworkers and teamwork are suffering and you know finger pointing and relationships are ruined because they are being asked to execute a suboptimal and I'm being generous methodology mm -hmm. so so a good methodology saves projects mm -hmm. it saves jobs it saves relationships this is like the a methodology has such a huge blast radius you can have good leaders it's it's hard for a bad leader to undermine a good methodology. <laughs> and it's really difficult for a good leader and a good manager to succeed if they are dealt a poor methodology. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And honestly, I, I think this is really important for project leaders, change leaders, innovation leaders to hear this because I think the pendulum is sort of swung because, you know, you know, thinking about documentation. We've gone from being too documentation heavy to too light. And what you're trying to do is bring us back to the midline. Um, same thing with a good methodology. Maybe there was an overabundance of frameworks and methodologies, and then everybody stopped using them and that changed, or there wasn't a good one. And now what you're trying to do with your methodology is bring people back to the midline and create a framework for people to follow, but not be so rigid in the sense that, or so broad that it, um, you know, it's not effective for individuals and organizations. Cause I think there's a lot of, you know, changes happening constantly in organizations. I think there was a Gartner study that was talking about how the number of transformations a company went through in 2016 was two compared to 12 or 13 in 2022. And so in the absence of having a methodology that can withstand the test of time, but brings in that discipline and that empathy, then you've got a lot of people trying to do many different things at the same time. And that, to your point, can ruin jobs and relationships and really, mm -hmm. um, prevent organizations from innovating and successfully changing, which is really the foundation of how they will grow and remain viable. So I, I really like kind of how you, how you, how you frame this up and kind of cut through the clutter. Here are the five verbs. Here's how you think about it. Keep it simple, hold yourself accountable to it. And the rest will be that dance that you talk about sort of at the tail end of the book. Um, and if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about how you know, the, the example of um, uh, Latin dance and, and just sort of, you know, you talk about listening in the book and that innovate, that listening is sort of a pre prerequisite for innovation. And you bring in some examples from the performing out performing arts. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that can help individuals who are in roles where they are required or responsible for implementing change and innovation? How could they can think about dance 
and and that experience uh, to help inform their process in the workplace. Sure. So if I back up from just the topic of dance, if I think across the performing arts, we think of culture traits such as joining a team, someone being a beginner, rehearsal, practice, and the fact that we bring out the best in each other. Those are all great. Let's not be naive. We're competitive beings. So we audition a lot. We don't get the lead part a lot. Not every dance partner says, yes, I'd love to dance with you. So rejection is an underrated skill. Yeah. Both sides of rejection. Um, vigilance, keeping up, you know, use it or lose it. If if I go to a dance lesson and I don't practice that stuff for the next week and I show up, the, I don't have a prayer of remembering that stuff. And I cause rework for my other dance partners, right? It's annoying yeah. to the instructor, et cetera. Yeah. And then the, the, the performing arts also give us this incredible model for audience, I mean, customer centricity. Mm -hmm. They pay the bills. They might be forgiving. They might be picky. They might be distant. They might be intimate. So, so though across the performing arts, those culture traits of collaboration, competition, and audience centricity are really valuable because we need that for a viable business, for viable innovation organization. Yeah. So, so if I if I take a deep dive on dance, there's lead, there's follow. I don't monopolize my dance partners. I'm rotating. The learning never stops because once I, we plateau in salsa, I'll move on to bachata. I'll move on to cha cha. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sense of um, what else? I'm I'm actually drawing a blank on other um, re resilience. So yeah. So it's not a question of if the leader. <laughs> is going to mess up. It's only a question of when. When, yeah. And how much responsibility will I take on the dance floor? Not if, but when we mess up. You know what? Even if my dance partner messes up, no, it's me because I led and I'm yeah. I as the leader on the dance floor, I'm constantly asking myself, what else can I do to make this more fun for her? What else could I do so that I'm it's more uh, it's easier to follow me? Yeah. Um and also, again, going back to rejection, I, I joke that, you know, in my in my dance lessons, I asked the the ladies, ladies, it, it is just a song. <laughs> it's three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so if you're gonna say no, be able to to say no very politely, professionally, like be skilled at yeah. saying no. And yeah. gentlemen, gentlemen, you also have three minutes to be able to figure out whether she ever wants to dance with you again. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love that. I actually, that was something I'd called out rejection as a skill, giving and receiving. So giving rejection, receiving rejection, and also that conversation around resilience. I wrote that down that too, um, which is a really big piece of dance. And if you're going to mess up, how do you handle that? the same is very true for, for innovation. One thing that you just said, though, I think is a very important message for any leader to, to hear. And it's around, um, now I'm drawing the blanks. <laughs> like I want to like can... rewind it. It was, uh, oh, uh, the, the, the leading and the following being, yeah. um, something around like being the leader that people, you know, how do you, oh, how do you make it easier for them to follow you? That, yeah is the the key message how do you make it easier for your teams to follow you how do you make it easier for the you know the the people that are co-partners your dance partners easier to follow you that's such yeah. an important message that really translates well from the from performing arts into the business world because i don't think that is often the attitude of leaders in an organization it's you will follow me because I am your boss and your paycheck's coming from, you know, from me. Um, and I think that really undermines the potential for innovation, rapid innovation, um, innovation that doesn't cost, uh, that, you know, it's within, that stays within the boundaries of what it's meant to be without going, you know, delays and scope creep and all the fun things. Um, so I really, I really like how you've been able to to link those together. You also kind of coming back to this idea of resilience, though. Um, 
and would love to understand how this maybe translates into both worlds. Cause I do, I like this a lot. A poor methodology weakens a team's resilience to negative surprises, which or, you know, you mentioned the dance partner messing up or, you know, taking responsibility and the negative surprises that occur and that impact, uh, you know, how people are able to get the work done and change and innovate. What was your, you know, give some examples, if you don't mind, about negative surprises that come up that prevent innovation from happening. And maybe like one or two examples of how your methodology or how this you know, how the performing arts can um, help people who are in change management, project management, innovation roles overcome those negative surprises with more mm. grace and elegance. Yeah. Um, so one, um, one setting I will, that, that you're, you're triggering is the transparency of feedback. Mm-hmm. When I've been in a play, we might have a two or three hour rehearsal. And what happens afterwards? We all pile into the auditorium, exhausted. It's 10, 30, 11 at night. Some of us have 8 a.m. classes on the other side of campus. And we all hear each other's feedback because we can learn from feedback that is not directly relevant to us. Right. It is wicked transparency. It's amazing transparency and vulnerability. And it shows whether you are the lead character or whether you're like tree number 14, <laughs> none of that us are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're all learning from this feedback. Everyone's vulnerable. Everyone needs to stay humble. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that for a theater company, for the cast of a play, they're an amazing role model in terms of feedback, fearlessness. You, and you know what? Your self-esteem has to be able to handle that mm -hmm. feedback in public. Mm -hmm. And your humility has to be able to handle that feedback in public. So I don't expect tomorrow for companies to go out there and have like, you know, 20 people in an auditorium. But but I think it's it's a very useful um, model. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so feedback, vulnerability, um, the, the book, um, the second book that trails the first book by about two or three months, it has a tool that I call the approachability menu. Mm -hmm. And it's, its aim is to reduce the barriers of feedback so that coworkers will give each other feedback. That's, that's absolutely useful. It, my, my, uh, my point of view is that there is too much unhelpful feedback out there. Right. Right. Like, oh, Johnny's just not a team player. Not helpful, right? right? But if I can coach innovation professionals and give them the tool, the template to say, you get to give feedback in the three communication channels. If you mm -hmm. have an issue with a coworker, distill it down to their, one, their meeting etiquette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Punctuality, are they monopolizing? Are they multitasking? Number two, their email etiquette. They're not responsive. They can't spell. My <laughs> all syndrome, right? So their email etiquette or their contribution to structured documentation. So going back to the five verbs, maybe you thought Susie should have been the approver of the training materials instead of just the drafter or, right? Someone just has the wrong verb. Mm -hmm. that, that, that happens. But when you coach people that way or, and you, you give them advance notice, that these are the eligible forms of feedback for each other. You, I think it, it, it's a wonderful tool to minimize personality conflicts yeah. and basically say, that's out of scope. You don't get to have personality conflict. If you think you have an issue, if you perceive an issue with someone, trust, tactical, strategic, whatever, you must distill it down. Cause it, cause if you do have an issue with a coworker, I promise you it's about their communication. Mm -hmm. Well, there are only three communication channels. So before any, you know, uh, friction in the workplace rises to like on a scale from one to 10 to like a seven or an eight or a nine, no, be approachable while the level of conflict is still mild and put it in terms of their meeting etiquette, their email etiquette their contribution to structured documentation because everything else 
you you don't get to comment on oh johnny's necktie i don't like his necktie or you know their cube is decorated obnoxious no you I hope Not people are, are making comments about neckties and, and cube <laughs> decorations. You know, I mean, what you're talking about, though, too, I mean, Stephen Covey talks about the speed of trust and you're talking about having a high trust organization. And to be able to have that, you have to eliminate the subjective uh, personality driven comments and keep it really to the work at hand. And that could prevent some of yeah. those conflicts that you're talking about, which is what slows down change and innovation. Um, you know, interesting, and I'm sure you know this uh, because you are also a change professional um, and many other hats that you've worn, um, that connection piece, that relationship, that giving feedback and being able to receive feedback is so important because, you know, when I, when I think about what a change management professional, for example, does a lot of what they're doing is documentation, especially up front when they're thinking about the impacts of what the innovation or change will be on the organization, on its people. Um, but a lot of what they're there to do is listen and build relationships and hear people out and they get a lot of that subjective feedback. So how do they distill from that kind of the core essence of what the issues are and having some sort of framework to to kind of receive that information and then give feedback to the individuals that are impacted by the change in a very, uh, you know, using an approachable methodology seems like a really good strategy to get to the heart of the issue without um, mm -hmm. letting some of the other interpersonal, the self-concerns, uh, those fears get in the way of innovation and change. Um, I, I subtitle that tool. I know you hate me, but what do you want me to do differently? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey, I, that's a great way of that's a great way of framing up the my, tool. My HR department what was laughing less than you're laughing, but uh, um, I think I made my point. <laughs> I like it. Um, well, I I really enjoyed the book. I can't wait for it to come out because the uh, the directness of the insights I loved. It was refreshing and I um, I really appreciated that. But I also really appreciated how you balanced the two needs of discipline and empathy and built that into a methodology that will give people guidance on how to move forward so their organizations can change and innovate and do all the things that it needs to do. Um, and then you've obviously got a second book coming out too, which I'm sure um, I'll uh, be reading as well. Is there anything else that you would like to say or share about um, any tips for change leaders, project leaders, uh, and then information on where people can go buy your book when it comes out? Mm, thanks. Um, so I will uh, resurrect, remind people that there's this term out there called VUCA. Yeah. That stands for volatile, <laughs> uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And too many organizations are surrendering to VUCA. Yeah. Um, instead, please ask yourself, what would a symphony do? What would a dance couple do? What would a theater company do? And if you, you are unable to be on script, being off script, as in improvising, playing yes and with each other is great. But being oblivious to knowing to not knowing whether you are on script or off script is not a good thing. Yeah. So I, w when teams feel demoralized or struggling, and they're they're having a hard time um, finding a path forward, I hope that they'll find some inspiration from any of the performing arts, because it will channel culture traits of collaboration, and instead of competition, I'm going to call it ambition, whether it's individual ambition or, or ambition on behalf of your team, mm -hmm. ambition on behalf of your customer. And it's, you know, as cliche as it, as it sounds and is, it's never about us. It is, it constantly has to be about the ensemble. It has to be about our customer because when we're so self-centric, an audience of one, a customer of one, Mm -hmm. That's not scalable. It's not lucrative. Uh, it's not fun. It's working in a silo. And so um, maybe I'll try to end on that note is 
I just hope readers and, and your listeners, your community, Jess, will find inspiration from any of the performing arts. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the moment, my book, um, the two books separated by about three months will be in all the typical places, um, Ingram Spark and Amazon. And I don't know where else exactly yet. It's just, it's been a, um, nothing is fast with this process. Um, (laughs) So, um, but yeah, I I hope it's helpful. I I think one of the strengths of the book, books and the methodology is it is, it, it makes it incredibly easy to say no. Mm -hmm. And as you go through every chapter of this book, you are absolutely empowered to say, oh, for those documentation, for the for the folks who are averse to documentation, now it gives you a name. You can say process flows, counterproductive, project charter. Count- so now you have a name. If and when you're going to say no to certain documentation, now you have a name. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you don't like aspects of a factory, like, oh, speed, quality, waste, <laughs> overrated. Well, now, <laughs> now it gives you the label and the culture trait to say, you know what, that metaphor of a factory and, and the, the relevance of speed or quality. Yeah. That doesn't, that, that doesn't affect, that doesn't apply to us. So my hope is over the next few years, my readers will, will say, yes, they'll say, no, they'll play. Yes. And this book is not static. A second edition is inevitable. Mm-hmm. I'm one person. So I hope that it, sets the table for readers, all innovation professionals to take it and and play their own version of yes and. Just take yeah. what you like, adopt at whatever speed, path of least resistance, whatever works for your team is the right answer. Um, but then if, if your status quo is all that, own it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least be willing to do that. Well, I'm I'm excited for people who end up reading this book because I think it'll give them some ideas on how to find that balance and and be able to innovate in a way that is um, effective and efficient and keeps people happy and in their jobs uh, because of what you've outlined in the book. Um, well, thank you so much for the conversation today. Mm-hmm. And I wish you so much success with the book. And when, you, when it does finally... Um, Publish, let me know and I'll promote it on uh, Apogee and Teams That Are Insights podcast and pages that are out there, social media, YouTube, all the fun things. But thanks again for your time today. And yeah, I'll be I'll be watching from, from the sidelines cheering you on. Thanks so much, Robert. <laughs> thanks for your encouragement, your support, the time you invested in reading. Uh, it, it means a lot to You're have you, it was great. You, you on board. It's great. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for listening and until next time, take care.